Sometimes it's better for me to just sit back, bite my tongue, and then in four years I'll be able to say what I want. There has been a gradual institutionalization of this uh, code of, of conduct, the effect of which is to prevent people from ventilating their views. Bright students won't put up with it. Buckley fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard and examined in good faith. They stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber at Yale. We disagree, we debate, and then at the end of the day, we remain friends. Welcome everyone to Pod and Man at Yale, the official podcast of the Buckley Institute. I'm your host, Ari Schaefer, the Buckley Institute's Director of Communications. Please subscribe to Pod and Man at Yale on the App Store, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please, if you like what you hear, leave a review. If you don't, leave a review on someone else's podcast. Today, we'll be discussing the state of free speech at Yale and the affirmative action decision with our esteemed panelists, Libby Snowden, a Yale senior, junior, Trevor McKay, and Will Barbie, a sophomore. So in true Buckley fashion, let's get right to it. Get your tickets today for disinvitation dinner at the fabulous Plaza Hotel in New York City on September 27th. The September 13th deadline for tickets is coming fast. Celebrate the Buckley Institute free speech and those ideas too dangerous for the campus orthodoxy. Get your tickets today at buckleyinstitute.com slash disinvitation2023. Again, buckleyinstitute.com slash disinvitation2023. I want to welcome our three panelists, Libby. Hello. Trevor. Happy to be here. And Will. Thanks, guys. All right, let's get started. Free speech on campus is a bit of a broad concept, so I want to focus first on free speech in the classroom. Do you guys feel there's a political bias in uh, the Yale classroom in terms of which answers are acceptable, what you can say? Uh, There's certainly a kind of sense that one shouldn't broach controversial topics in the classroom. That would be topics that would be kind of uh, controversial from a liberal perspective, certainly. Um, I think it varies greatly on the professor. Uh, I think the professor really sets the tone for a classroom, particularly for me as a history major taking a lot of seminars. Um, A professor that's honest and seeks out dissent can really make or break a seminar uh, as to whether or not it feels like there is bias. How about you, Will? Also, just like to, uh, uh, I'd say draw a distinction also between what we've been talking about with the professors and then with the other sort of influences in the classroom, such as the TAs uh, or sort of professors who are brought in, not tenured professors, because uh, personally, in my experience, I found the tenured professors, um, particularly in the humanities departments, to be relatively um, steadfast in their sort of commitment to um, probing individuals on their beliefs. But um, in certain sort of lower stakes, I guess you could call them sections, uh, with something like a TA who's a you know obviously responsible for uh, to the professor and responsible for your grades, I've definitely found that the uh, environment there can definitely be a little less open. So one of the things that people talk a lot about, you know, we talk a lot about here at the Buckley Institute is self censorship in the classroom. So, Will, do you have any experiences? Do you remember any times when you felt pressure to self censor? Hmm. you know, self-censor, I think, is definitely a strong word, whether it's self-censoring or just sort of mm, not being, um, not quite fully agreeing with everybody in the, in the room. And then sort of when I do share my opinion that it's not really picked up by the professor or not really explored further, it's just sort of shut down. I wouldn't necessarily say I've had to limit what I say, but I definitely don't think that what I do say is always... Um, taken with as much seriousness, perhaps, as uh, somebody else with a view that aligns with the professor. Uh, How about you, Trevor? Um, I think it definitely depends on the class, but I've definitely, you know, self-censored myself in class as much as I would hate to say it. And I've been fortunate to have professors who who can sometimes see that. They know my views because I've talked to them outside of class and at other events, and they will occasionally you know, look at me and ask me, you know, like, what do you think? And try to draw out that idea. They want a lot of professors in the history department uh, want kind of disparate ideas, the clash of ideas. I mean, history is dead if there's, if there's no disagreement about what history is true and what is not. Otherwise, it's not history. So let's go to Libby. Uh, you're, in a sci- you're a science major. Um, in your science classes, does stuff like this ever come up? In class, 
not really. Um, when you're talking about quantum mechanics, there's not a lot of room to talk about the latest Republican primary debate necessarily. Um, but I mean, I do think that we see professors or grad students or um, lecturers, you know, might inject their political opinions from time to time. Um, in some of my STEM classes that aren't necessarily for my major, uh, things like six classes maybe, <laughs> um, it's really interesting to sort of see the the problems or the situations that the professor proposes. Um, Can you think of any in particular? I know I could. Um, <laughs> I like put there, you on the spot there. There were, there were definitely a couple where – like we were talking about a data set having to do with climate change or like forest fires or something like that. And I was like, interesting. I wonder like how we're manipulating the data like towards maybe a certain conclusion. So I just want to kind of drill in on something you guys have talked about. Um, there was a little bit of a mention of, you know, the other people in the class and how they contribute to the intellectual climate, the ability to share your opinions. And there's also been, and I was a little surprised by this, a lot of talk about the TA or the graduate student who's, you know, grading your papers or running your section. Um, so I guess who, which group do you think has more of an influence on how discussion in the class can go? So I think that there's a tendency, especially among political science seminars I've taken and history seminars I've taken, there's this assumption of truth, which is that you know if if somebody has kind of an orthodox liberal opinion and they say it, they're saying something that is an opinion, but they're believing that it is true. And that, you know, the, the assumption is that other people, mostly everyone in the room is going to agree with them. And so they say statements that, you know, are easily, you could easily argue against, but they're saying them as if they're, they're true and that why would anybody disagree with them? Um, Do people sometimes step up and say something? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly have in the past. I, I remember it one... It can't be you every time. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> people, you know, sometimes the professor will push back on that. But I think that it's it's kind of sad to see sometimes, you know, a student just already acting that way in a seminar from the very beginning. One particular instance that I could cite is I was in a class where basically a student was advocating for essentially a like speech board that would govern what is publishable and not publishable because some things, you know, shouldn't be allowed to be published. Um, and I pushed back, the professor also pushed back, so that was good to see. Um, but the student was saying this as if, you know, this is an obvious and true answer. Anyone else in the class kind of speak up in support of that? Some people did, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I basically said something to the effect of, uh, I, you know, this kind of elitist attitude is, is what God, Donald <laughs> Trump elected. But. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely something to be said for, you know, sitting in the same room as an expert in their field, right? But I think one of the biggest purposes of going and getting a university education is learning how to grapple with other ideas and learning how to discuss them with your peers and engage in thought that you agree with, disagree with, you name it. I mean, you know, I will say, you know, in the words of Dr. Jordan Peterson, if you have something to say, silence is a lie, right? And so, <laughs> and so that's sort of, I, I really would sort of encourage um, any student who disagrees with another student to make their voice heard and to step up. Don't just let it sort of fester and throw it up to say, oh, well, Yale's campus is too liberal or it's too woke. You know, you, it, the reason if it is that way, it's because there's not enough voices on the other side sort of expressing their opinions. And so, you know, it, it really falls on us to be as uh, vocal as, as we can about expressing our beliefs, forming, formulating our beliefs and uh, sharing them in and out of the classroom. When do you speak up? If a student just feels as though the only purpose of reading something is to dismantle it and just sort of disparage it and think, what can we not learn from this work? I generally try to step in and say, well, what can we learn from this work? There's a reason that we're reading this. It's not just so that we can, you know, talk about how Socrates is overrated or like he just doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a fool. You know, that's what they said back in his day. And, you know, look what happened there. Outside the classroom, when you're talking with friends, whether it's at lunch, in the dorm, um, what are your thoughts about speaking up and sharing your opinions in that sense? Trevor? I think that it's just as important to, to do it outside of the classroom, maybe if not more important than, than it is in the classroom. I've, from, from day one, been very comfortable in saying my opinion and have been branded within my residential college as that guy. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but... But I found people who who are happy to to be friends with me 
whether it was within my residential college or through through the Buckley Institute, through the Yale Political Union, um, through through other means who maybe they're liberal, maybe they're conservative, Marxists, you name it, whatever they are, there are people who are willing to indulge in that sort of honesty and that intellectual honesty to, to have a conversation and still be friends at the end of the day. And that's something that, broadly speaking, isn't just a problem at Yale. It's something that we see in the country today is that people can't can't be friends with each other because they voted for a different candidate. Yeah, yeah and I think that my sort of, one of my favorite aspects that I found about Yale and that I was surprised by is that um, these sort of conversations don't have to be held in an echo chamber, right? They don't have to be held where all the conservative kids are just hanging out with the conservative kids and all the liberal kids are just hanging out with the liberal kids, right? There's several spaces and forums, you know, the Buckley Institute is chief amongst them and, and so is the YPU, I feel, where um, you're sort of able to discuss things in an intellectual and thoughtful manner uh, together with people who disagree and then can go away and still recognize the humanity and the common sort of sense of purpose that we're all striving for by going here together. So I think that's definitely a positive. Came to Yale in the middle of COVID after the summer of 2020 and into the 2020 elections. It was a very tense time uh, for the nation and for an incoming college student coming to a university that was deemed as very liberal and very orthodox in that sense. Um, but I think as I've gotten more involved in groups like the Buckley Institute, um, and gotten more confident in my social circles, my ability to talk openly and confidently about my political opinions, regardless of if they fit whatever norm of the group that I'm talking with has grown. Have any of you guys lost friendships over your political opinions? I have lost a few friends at Yale, uh, due to political disagreements. And it's really unfortunate. It's difficult. And... Uh, especially when you come to college, like ready to make your best friends and your friends for life. Ultimately, administration and leadership, I think, still has a lot of work to do. Um, and the Buckley Institute is filling that void for now and doing good work in the meantime. The only other thing I would add is I totally agree about the Yale bureaucracy. I think they're a bunch, well, I think that they're very weak willed and they are not willing to defend their own policies. I think that bureaucrats inevitably trend towards trying to just keep their jobs relevant. And it's very unfortunate to see an institution like Yale that has bureaucrats who very often aren't dedicated to the mission of the institution. If you had to sum up the intellectual climate at Yale in just a few words, I know this is a tough question. I'm to like boil it down. Um, how would you describe um, the intellectual climate? I would say the state of intellectualism at Yale is sort of, I would say it's healthy from the bottom up and unhealthy from the top down in the sense that you know, when you sort of get to the bottom level of the students who are here, I think that there is, um, as both Trevor and Libby have mentioned, a, a fairly solid sort of culture of we need to have discussions about things. Obviously, there are, you know, individual cases, but for the most part, it's healthy. Whereas from the top down, sort of, if you go towards the top of the administration, I don't think that there's a willingness to sort of stand up for students' right to sort of say what they want and to step in when students are not allowing other students to say what they want. And I think that that needs to change. All right. So now I want to turn uh, to the major story of the summer, Supreme Court's ruling against the constitutionality of affirmative action. Sorry about that. In college admissions. Libby, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I want to preface by saying I don't think affirmative action is something that I'm super well read on in every situation. Um, but I do think that ultimately the dismantling of affirmative action is prompting a lot of really important conversations about what is diversity? How are we striving to make up a student body that is diverse and healthy and dynamic um, that we really didn't have a whole lot in the past because we had this status quo of affirmative action and how that worked in the admissions process? Um, Trevor? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with the Supreme Court's decision. Um, I think that affirmative action has been an egregious wrong for multiple di multiple parties over multiple decades. Um, and I, I really enjoyed reading all of the different opinions in the decision, um, whether or not I agreed with them. Uh, I thought that it was a really good exhibition of how the legal process should work when it comes to the constitutionality of particular policies or laws. Um, I stand with the sort of ruling by the Supreme Court. I think that they did make the right decision. 
and um, I feel that the the reasoning um, by the majority, especially by John Roberts's opinion, I think was really well crafted and lines up very much with sort of how I believe that I, I think that his sort of definition of diversity and where diversity can be important um, was sort of where my uh, opinion lies as well. And so I, I was very happy to see that. The affirmative action decision came out in late June. About three or four weeks later, the YDN sent out an email with different perspectives on the decision. Um, by my count, of the nine op-eds and editorials that they highlighted, um, only one of them supported the affirmative action decision, i.e. getting or eliminating um, affirmative action in college decisions. I mean, it's not particularly sophisticated math. That's just over 10% of the responses. Do you think that's an accurate portrayal of the Yale community? The other way I would look at it is saying, well, who is affirmative action affecting, right? It's not affecting the kids who got into Yale. It's the voices that aren't on campus that it most affects. It's the people who didn't get into Yale because of the affirmative action policies. And so it sort of makes sense to me that, you know, it would be less likely to hear a more vocal sort of you know, in favor, uh, opinion in favor uh, of the decision from the Supreme Court on Yale. But outside of Yale, I think that the decision was much more sort of favorable because of that. That's the target demographic of who it's affecting is the people who didn't get in. I think it again, it kind of goes back to the assumption of what is the truth. It's like the people that I've spoken to, many of them who who support affirmative action seem incredulous at the notion of not supporting affirmative action, which I find surprising. I think it's a policy. I think it's one that's easily that you can debate. I'm happy to debate in favor of it uh, in, with people in favor of it. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's really unfortunate that it actually is such a wide has such widespread acceptance as a policy at a place like Yale. I think one thing that I struggle with with the affirmative action debate in particular is we struggle to have room for nuance. Um, I think, I mean, maybe this is like plenty of other issues too, come to think of it. But I think as soon as we hear that somebody is pro affirmative action, we have a set of assumptions about what that means. Um, same thing when somebody's against affirmative action, there's a set of assumptions about like what that means and what else that person believes. Um, and there's not a lot of thinking critically about the second, third, fourth order effects. Um, unfortunately, I think we just, we live in a time where the attention span just isn't quite as strong, um, as we'd like it to be. And we just kind of want to get our opinion out there. Um, we want the punchline and yeah, I don't know that we have the, the patience really to like sift through the nuance. And I think that's kind of reflected, um, in the seemingly, I don't know, one-sidedness of the slew of YDN op-eds here. One of the op-eds that the YDN sent out described as the YDN, um, you know, termed it the racist origins of the SAT um, and referred to the quote-unquote assassination of affirmative action. Um, the Yale College Council um, quote-unquote unequivocally condemned the Supreme Court decision. Um, how do you think this sets the stage for discussing the affirmative action decision, you know, in the fall semester, spring semester? Yeah, I think one thing that I'm particularly struck by in looking at the quotes you pulled um, is, are words matter? Um, <laughs> the blanket statements like racist origins of the SAT and the assassination of affirmative action, like, that's fine if you want to discuss that and talk about that. But I think to Will's point, like there are a lot of students that just don't necessarily have a super formed opinion on affirmative action. And so not only when you see eight op-eds in favor of maintaining affirmative action and condemning the Supreme Court and only one that agrees with the Supreme Court opinion, you see that, but you also see racist origins of the SAT and you don't support affirmative action, you support the Supreme Court ruling. This creates this idea that like you're going to get branded as a racist. So there is a small window for race to still be part of the admissions decisions. I don't know if you read the coverage, if you read the the ruling itself. Chief, Chief Justice Roberts, in writing the majority opinion, wrote that, quote, nothing prohibits universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life 
so long as that discussion is concretely tied to a quality of character or you know, what student can contribute to the campus. How do you think universities like Yale, other Ivy League universities um, that used uh, that employed affirmative action, how do you think they're going to take that exception? Well, I, I think that first and foremost just needs to be the box checking needs to go away, right? And so any sort of box checking that says whenever you put down what race you are on the common application to Yale, I don't think that that should have any sway at all over um, whether you are admitted. Looking at those essays, that's where it really, that's where true character uh, comes from when you're talking about um, who, we sh- who should we admit to a high-level university. It's when they share their own sort of personal beliefs, personal experiences, and that will still maintain the sort of meaning and diversity. I really do think that diversity will be maintained on Yale's campus if they just stick solely to those criteria. Libby? Yeah, I completely agree with Will. I think the essays are the place for students of different races, different backgrounds to explain in great detail how their identity has shaped their experiences, their lives, why they want to go to college, why they want to go to this college. Um, I think that provides a lot more insight into the character of a person than whatever box they check for their race or their nationality. Well, Will, Libby, Trevor, thank you so much for joining us for the first episode of Pod and Men at Yale. It's wonderful having you all. Thanks thank for you. having us. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Now with that, let's get right to our interview with former White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney. We'll be speaking at Yale on Tuesday, September 12th at 4.30 p.m. Check out our website for more details. Mick Mulvaney managed the White House as Chief of Staff to the President served as director of the Office of Management and Budget, and also served as acting director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Mr. Mulvaney was also ambassador and special envoy to Northern Ireland. Prior to his executive branch service, Mr. Mulvaney was elected four times to the United States House of Representatives and served in the South Carolina House and Senate. Prior to public service, he worked in various roles as a lawyer, real estate developer, restaurant owner, operator, and franchiser and home builder. Thank you so much for joining us. It's good to be here. Looking forward to being on campus as well here in a couple of days. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. We're, we're really looking forward to having you as well. Um, but, you know, listening to your bio, you know, it's hard not to see that there are a few out there who know the White House and the inner workings of the executive, of, executive office of the president, as well as you do. Uh, what would you say was the most surprising thing you found while working at the White House? Oh, <laughs> there's a long list of them. Um, although in fairness, I, I, I think that I probably had fewer surprises than the other three uh, chiefs of staff to Donald Trump, because I was actually I was already working at the White House. I was in the Office of Management and Budget for fully two years before I took the job as chief of staff. So I, I was familiar with the way the place worked. I was familiar with the people, I was familiar most importantly with the president. You know, when uh, Reince Priebus took over, he did not know the president that well. John Kelly knew him hardly at all. And Mark Meadows knew him from, you know, talking to him on the phone a couple of times. So um, uh, I probably had fewer surprises <laughs> than all the rest of them. Uh, I guess if there was one thing, um, you know, uh, he never slept. So we only slept about four hours a night. Oh, and wow. I, yeah, I can't do that. And so <laughs> I, work from, uh, I work from six until eight. Um, pretty much every day. And I had a team come in about noon that was, you know, on call till about 2 a.m. because that's about what he did. He never called me. Uh, he made one time called me late at night after I was to wake me up on something important. But generally speaking, we had almost around the clock coverage just because the man never slept. Oh, my God. Wow. Four hours a night. How did he sustain that? I, I, you know, I've known a couple of people like that in my lifetime. My roommate in college was like that. My brother, to a certain extent, is like that. Some folks just don't need the sleep. Um, but thankfully, most of them recognize that that's unusual and that they can't <laughs> other people to work on the same schedule. He um, used to see sleep as a uh, as a weakness. I remember uh, flying on Air Force One a couple of times, which is, it's lovely, don't get me wrong. It's just not nearly as luxurious as people think. It's only got one bed, and it's uh, it's not mine. So I slept <laughs> on the floor. Typically, I'd sleep on the floor of my office on a yoga mat, um, wow. but he used to walk the plane at night to see who was sleeping because uh, <laughs> sleeping was a sign of weakness. Um, so as head of the OMB, um, you made cutting regulations a top priority. 
Um, mm-hmm. I, part of what I want to look into is, you know, what the actual day-to-day of these jobs you've held and these high-profile jobs is. So what's the actual day-to-day of cutting regulations like? What does it actually mean to want to do that? Well, we, you know, we there's actually a piece of OMB called the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA, and that is the chief clearinghouse. Think of OMB as a as a giant train station, okay? Mm-hmm. And most folks are familiar a little bit with the function that OMB has on money, which is essentially uh, bef- money. Uh, the Treasury collects the money. Uh, and then they come to us and say, well, we want to send it over to this agency and we make sure that the agency is doing what they're supposed to do before the money goes to them. So every single dollar that flows out into the federal government flows through OMB. It comes in through Treasury, in essence, and out through OMB. Um, mm-hmm. uh, regulations are, are basically the same. There's a few ex- ex- exceptions on some regu- uh, Treasury regulatory work, but 98% of all the regulations in the federal government go through OMB. Why is that? Um, because we're the we we sit on top of we're sort of the management consulting firm that sits on top of the the executive branch. And when you're overdoing a regulation at the Department of Commerce, there's no way that you, there's no way for you to talk to every other federal agency to make sure what you are doing is not in conflict with something that they are doing or is duplicative to duplicative to what they are doing. That's the that's OMB's charge, and they we do that through the Office of Information Regulatory Affairs, OIRA. Uh, and those are the folks who drove much of the deregulatory policy. But the biggest challenge we had, Ari, was that it had been um, almost 40 years since any administration had really put a prioritization on deregulation. And what we found is that the agencies didn't know how to do it, Um, that physically there was no form to fill out. There was no box to check. They knew how to regulate, but they had forgotten how to wow. deregulate because it had been so long since they since they had done it. So it took us, it was a very, very slow sort of ramp up because we had to change the, you know, change the, the the direction of this aircraft carrier, this huge ship in the ocean, and you can't turn it on a dime. So uh, that was one of the biggest challenges we faced. Hearing that OIRA is among the most powerful offices or, you know, most significant offices in the government. Yeah, it's not wrong. Uh, again, when you've when you've got your finger, you know, in every pie, yeah, you you get a chance to actually get some stuff done. So that was uh, that was fun. It was a lot of fun, and we had a lot of success. Um, I'll never forget. I have a great deal of uh, of admiration for the people who work at OMB, the career staff who go from the Bush administration to the Obama administration to the Trump administration to the Biden administration. That's about ninety eight percent of the White House doesn't change. Oh, wow. Um, and the really good bureaucrats are the ones who work just as hard for Republicans as they do for Democrats and vice versa. And I saw a lot. Of, I didn't see a lot of that at the CFPB. I did see a lot of that mm-hmm. OMB. And, you know, I remember sitting down with the, the, the senior team there and said, look, I, I we're in charge to cut all these regs. Where, where do you where do you suggest looking? Uh, starting. How do we talk, how do we do this? How do we start? He says, well, you could start with the secret list. When I said, I never heard of the secret list. And I said, see, it worked. And apparently <laughs> what Obama had done um, at the at the end of his first term, um, they were trying to thread a needle with not being too sort of aggressive on regulating, especially the environment. They, they needed to satisfy their environmental wing of the party, but they didn't want to upset sort of the centrist wing of the party. So they started to use a non-public list, I can't remember the real name of it, um, to sort of telegraph what they were doing so that the left would be happy, but not go as far as sort of starting it so that the, the centrist wing of the party wouldn't be unhappy. Um, and it worked. Of course, he won re-election and it was a, a huge success. Um, and they kept it. And I think there were 700 regs on that list. Were they um, actually I- in effect? They were, no, they weren't in effect. They were, they were, they were pre, sort of. It's we're going. This is what we want. This is we're moving in this direction. Okay. This is this is this is what we're working to satisfy the activists without upsetting the sort of the wow. the mainstream. And so when we were able to sort of kill that list, we we it was one of the biggest, you know, deregulatory actions we were able to take and just stop, you know, on a dime, uh, that activity in uh, in almost every single agency. That was interesting. I would not have known about that, but for the work of the folks who worked at OMB. Um, so, kind of moving back to the you know the chief of staff role, like day to day, what is it like? I mean, obviously, I don't want any you know inside secrets, but like, what's a day to day of a chief of staff? Just making sure the things that come out of the meeting actually get done. Is that kind of? 
you know, there's a, there's a lot more to it than that, obviously, because you've got you've got people there who are in charge of record keeping. You know, people that are in charge of any making sure documents go where they're supposed to go. Um, you know, this has become a big issue with a document retention case in Florida. But right. there's an entire infrastructure of people in the White House in charge of tracking documents. Uh, when you're no longer president, that goes away. But when you're in the White House, that that exists. So yeah, and there's a bunch of folks tracking policy, a bunch of folks tracking. Um, you know, how does what we just talked about line up with, you know, this senator versus that House member versus that committee chairman versus that, um, you know, uh, uh, ranking member. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, listen, the days went by very, very mm -hmm. quickly. Um, there was never really um, a, a boring minute um, in the White House. In fact, and I'll, I'll stop with this, uh, when Sarah Huckabee Sanders left in the summer of 2019, I remember talking to her, I don't know, six or eight weeks later, and I said, how you doing? And she goes, I'm still unwinding. And I said, that's, wow. that's, that's shocking to me. And I said, why? She goes, what you don't realize, Mick, is that you're living on adrenaline um, every single day because everything you do is front page news of the Washington Post or the New York Times or CBS or CNN. And you don't realize that your body is living on the adrenaline. Wow. And it's hard to stop doing that. It does take a couple of weeks. And that's no different, by the way, from a Democrat to a Republican administration. That's what I've heard from folks is that this, there's a couple of different reasons that, that the positions of the White House typically don't last forever. People forget Barack Obama had four um, uh, chiefs of staff, including one acting in his first term. Trump had four. The average life expectancy, I think, of a, of a chief is about 15 to 16 months, which is about wow. what I did. Um, but it's not, it's not, um, it's, it's, it's intense. I can uh, only imagine. Intense job. So, um, so kind of taking a step back into your background, I saw your campaign website bio. It says you were a bad wrestler in high school or not good wrestler in high school. Say that? <laughs> it does say something to that effect. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And you turned that somehow into a congressional career. Um, so how did you make that jump from mediocre bad wrestler bad. to... Um, I was a bad wrestling was uh, I didn't start growing until I didn't hit my growth spurt until my freshman year in college. So I wrestled at 96 pounds as a senior, I think. Oh wow! Oh my god! Um, I weighed really? over 100 pounds when I graduated. So, um, but when you only weigh 95, 94 pounds, there's not a lot of muscle there to do a lot. Of <laughs> um, I don't know how you know. Listen, I got into politics accidentally. Mm -hmm. I got into politics locally. I had um, someone that I did not consider to be a good local lawmaker. Um, and I had uh, many in interactions with him, um, ask me if I would support him if he ran for the state legislature. And I said, well, you know, I got to tell you, I was thinking about running that for that myself. And I wasn't. I just didn't want him to <laughs> be a rep. Um, and I won that race. And then I won a senator. I was the first Republican in my House district um, in history, the wow. second Republican in my Senate district in history. I was the first Republican in this congressional district since the 1880s. The, the previous wow, uh, the previous um, uh, Republican had been a slave who uh, who got to the North during the war, then came back to South Carolina. Um, and 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 uh, Robert Smalls, very famous man, his, his pictures on the wall in the uh, in the Congress. A very impressive guy. And but that was the last Republican. So I, I got into this sort of accidentally. I never really expected to uh, to win most of these races so we hear you know at yale there are a bunch of students you know that we interact with who do think about having a public service career uh, yeah. what was the calculation like for you um to actually make the leap to decide you were going to run well it wasn't like i said it was the calculation it wasn't i i, I was i was a, had a real estate practice i was doing you know was, we were developing real estate i had been practicing law in the past i wasn't doing that at the time and then i had gotten in the restaurant business. So I had two or three things going in the private sector. And I got into this mostly to prevent somebody else from being <laughs> my rep. And it's not a, that's not made up. Um, and when I asked my wife if I could run for Congress against John Spratt, John has uh, was here for 28 years. He was the budget committee chairman, old conservative Southern Democrat, really good guy. And uh, she goes, well, that depends. I said, well, she goes, can you win? And I said, I don't have a snowball's chance in hell. And she said, well, then you can run. Because the last thing you need is you leave. When, I, when we made that decision, the triplets, we, I, 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 had, I have triplets. They're 23 now, but they were nine. Wow. Um, so, yeah, we didn't really expect to, uh, to win. So there was not really much calculation as much as sort of stumbling through it. So then why, if you didn't think you were going to win, why would why did you decide to run in the first place? Oh, uh, that was easy because uh, this was the year that uh, Obamacare uh, had, was being debated. 
and um, it was a hot issue. And my fear was that my conservative Southern Democrat uh, congressman, who I actually had voted for in the past, again, he's a really, really excellent uh, gentleman, um, would be able to vote for what I considered to be a really bad piece of legislation without being called to uh, to mm. to account for it. So do you have any tips for maybe some Yale students who are looking to enter public service? Yeah, I do. And I'm dead serious about this. Get a real life first. <laughs> and I'm not joking about that. I, you know, I know some really, really nice, smart people who are members of Congress who've never had a job outside of Washington, D.C. And that doesn't make for a good lawmaker. Um, mm -hmm. You need to have a real life. You need to have another career. You need to do something else and bring that what I call real world experience. I'm making those, you know, real world, the real world experience before you decide to run for Congress. You can be an effective lawmaker if you've over ever been a staffer on the Hill and a chief of staff or whatever. And there's a lot of folks who take that path. But my experience was that the people who came to politics as a second or even third career um, were much, much more effective. Um, they understood the, the impact of legislation and regulation on the real world. They understood what it was like to have to deal with a government, you know, as as not as someone making the law, but someone is receiving, you know, the impact mm -hmm. of that law and so forth. And I, I always thought that you could tell the people who had been in government all their life or people who had been in the real world, even if it's a government related job, like a teacher or in the military, that counts. That's to me the real world. The government is not um, anything. Uh, instead of going straight into politics, I think would serve you extraordinarily well. Students who are um, afraid to speak up, whether they're afraid of what their press professors will do or they're afraid of what their classmates will think of them. Um, we had a survey, I think 63% of college students we surveyed across the country were intimidated from speaking up because their classmates, 58% because of their professors. Uh, and that, you know, although conservatives were more likely to be intimidated, that was true across all ideological uh, leanings. What are your advice for those students who have an opinion? They're a little worried, might get not get received well in the classroom. You know, I, I'm going to give a I'll give a, uh, a an unusual answer, which is, um, and I heard this when my my son goes to uh, to law school, and it was uh, the 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 dean of law schools it was uh, it was a classmate of mine. Um, when I was in school, he's a he's a buddy of mine, and he gave oh. a great presentation. He's like, stop worrying about your grades. Stop worrying about whether or not you're you're pissing off a, a professor or or, or whether really or not you're going to get an A or B. It doesn't make any difference anymore. You're here, okay? What's going to matter is what kind of person are you when you walk out of here? What what skill sets up here and in here are you going to bring to wherever you do? If it's private sector, if it's if it's if it's not for profit, if it's if it's government, whatever. What what are you going to be? No no one cares about your grades after you get into an institution like Yale. You go to Yale. That, that everybody knows you're smart. Whether or not you had an A or a C doesn't really make that much difference. Um, so don't worry about professors who might try to punish you um, because you're not giving them, you know, the what exactly what they want to hear. Um, you know, you have to be smart. You always do. You have to be political. We all we all do. I remember, you know, I, I knew the teachers in law school that I had to say, okay, I know this teacher, and the teacher wants me to say this. And I can say this, it's fine. It's it's just part of the rote memorization of, of, of the interpretation of a Supreme Court case. That's a piece of cake. Um, but learning how to do that and then learning how to, uh, but but at the same time, learning how to think is, is, is the critical part. That's what you go to school for. You don't go to school to be indoctrinated. You go to school to learn how to think. And um, as long as folks remember that and are aware of the biases, I think you can, you, you can do fine. It's a shame that it's not universities used to be a hotbed of First Amendment privileges, um, and now they're not, and that's a shame. But uh, you're not going to get back to it unless you've got students who come out of there thinking, you know what, it would have been even better if I could have had a really healthy debate about this issue and, and offered both sides or all sides of, a, of an argument. Um, maybe the pendulum swings back at some point in the future. Just one last question. Um, you know, Bill Buckley is an important figure figure for us. We're named you know, after him, significant at Yale too, um, significant alumnus. Um, did he have any impact on your life, whether through National Review, Firing Line? Oh, yeah, we, uh, you know, I, I watched Firing Line. It was fun. I mean, you know, how, is not, how is it not fun to watch? I mean, the guy was so fabulous um, in his presentation. But really, the connection here is in Chester, uh, not Chester, yeah, uh, not Chester. Oh, um, Camden, South Carolina, just down the road from me. It was in my congressional district is where the Buckley School is to this day. 
um, the Buckley Speaking School, the Public Speaking School. And I, 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 and I know his brother was more involved with it than he was, but he was heavily involved with it. So there's a local connection. And at the local golf course, um, there's actually a, a plaque uh, to both of Buckley's on the first tee because uh, I used to love to play golf down there. So there's a there's a local connection. But no, I you know I, I watched. I was really young when Firing Line was on. I think <laughs> my dad watched it when I was a kid. Um, but um, it, it's 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 uh, it's going to be great to come up and uh, and speak at his old stomping grounds. That's going to be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I can do my impersonation. It depends how much wine I have. <laughs> uh, maybe in the bar afterwards, I'll do my my William F. Buckley impersonation. I'm sure students would love to hear it. Um, well, thank you so much for making the time. Look forward to having you up here in a few weeks. It was really a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks, Gary. All the best. And that wraps up our first episode of Pod and Man at Yale. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And always remember, for God, for country, for Yale, in that order.